speaker is Dr. Paul Shattuck. Uh, Dr. Shattuck is the leader of the Course Outcomes Research Program at the A.J. Drexel Autism Institute. This week, Drexel released the National Autism Indicator Report, Transition into Young Adulthood. Uh, Dr. Shattuck will share with us the findings of the report. Please. Thank you, Stuart. Good morning, everybody. I appreciate the invitation here. Let me just pull up some slides. Yes, I'm Paul Shattuck, and I'd like to talk to you uh, briefly about the National Autism Report, uh, The Transition to Adulthood. I run the Life Course Outcomes Research Program at the A.J. Drexel Autism Research Institute at Drexel University in um, Philadelphia, and I'm very grateful to be here. The question, oh, I'm going to time myself, because I, I want to be a good, a good speaker, because I know these, these, these young interns here are going like, to keep me on my toes. All right, so people ask me, what the heck is a life course? What does that mean? Um, let me use an example. Let's take a young man named Miguel. Uh, Miguel's been in high school for five years. He's on the autism spectrum. He gets a variety of, of services through special education, mental health counseling, speech and language therapy, um, some special tutoring and academic assistance. And uh, after five years, he, he walks across that stage. He gets that diploma. He's officially no longer in high school. A couple days later, this has all transpired within the course of a week. Miguel is fundamentally the, the same person in terms of behaviors, physical health, mental health, his capabilities and skill set. He hasn't personally gone through a tremendous uh, transformation at the skills and ability level in the course of a few days, but his relationship to society is, is fundamentally altered and will forever be different than it was for the first uh, decade and a half of his life. He is no longer entitled to the range of services he was entitled to when he was in high school and receiving special education help. He is now, he and his family have now entered a world of very fragmented and siloed services that are not well coordinated, are difficult to acquire, and have differing eligibility rules. Um, his, his life is more uncertain. And in special education, the, the process is supposed to work that during the high school years, um, young people in special ed are supposed to be obtaining assistance to develop a transition plan so that when people leave high school, they're supposed to be stepping in to either employment um, or some kind of post-secondary educational opportunity. Um, we do, uh, in my program, we do a lot of what's called indicators research. So what the heck is indicators research? Um, I use the, the example of a, a car as, as a, a metaphor that most people have familiarity driving a car. You have your dashboard. You look at indicators all the time when you're driving. You've got a speedometer, a gas gauge, an odometer, maybe a navigation screen. These indicators give you feedback about how far you've gone, how fast you're going, whether you're approaching your destination or if you've taken a wrong turn. Indicators are often used in uh, the public sphere. We think of the employment rates, um, different economic indicators. These things give us guidance and uh, an impression about whether we're changing over time as a society or as communities. So um, I'm the guy that came up with the, the, the 50,000 people a year aging out of school estimate. You know, we think in terms of big population numbers in our program. And unfortunately, the, the situation in terms of the national picture of having meaningful indicators that can inform action looks more like this. Um, this is a, an old Model T car that had no dashboard. And we have very few credible, reliable statistics at the national level um, and we're trying to change that in our program. So we hear a lot of people talk about moving the needle on transition outcomes. I take that very literally. I think, well, we need a needle. <laughs> so we're trying to build the gauges that will detect whether we're making progress over time. So we uh, put out this report, which uh, you have copies out on the table in the hallway there. It's available online at our website. And the goal of our report was to, to do the best we could with the data available to paint a picture of what the transition situation looks like for young people on the autism spectrum. What do they um, need? What kinds of help do they get during transition? And what do the outcomes look like in young adulthood? Uh, we've spent approximately one and a half billion uh, from 2008 to 2012 uh, on federal and private funders for research. Um, in special education alone, a recent report estimated that we spend in the neighborhood of $10 billion a year in services for students on the autism spectrum. Um, so are we moving the needle? 
Uh, it's kind of hard to see, but go look at the report online. We talk, people tell us um, about the services cliff. I talked to families who've recently, uh, uh, their son or daughter has left high school and they talk about the dramatic services cliff, um, which was uh, discussed quite eloquently in, in the Dateline episode last week. Um, we have data that actually quantifies for different types of services what percentage of people were getting those services when they were in high school, enrolled in special education, and how did that rate of accessing services for this population change a few years later after high school. Um, one of the most dramatic falls, and one of the ones I, I'm concerned about the most, is speech language therapy. So, so social communication, the ability to, to communicate and interact with other people, is, is one of the most challenging things for a lot of people on the autism spectrum. Um, and speech language therapy is one of the few types of help that really specifically targets the social communication challenges that are so prominent and really kind of a defining feature of the autism spectrum. Um, it's the most commonly received service among people on the spectrum while they're in high school. And it's, it's the hardest to get service after high school because um, most of the funding streams available for healthcare services and state developmental disability services don't fund what's called um, habilitative care in the speech and language realm. Um, so we've, we've got a lot of problems in terms of capacity at the adult level for providing services and uh, creating funding streams for reimbursement for services. Just a couple other highlights. I could go on all day showing you slides of, of data and findings. Our, our report is 65 pages long. So. Um, yeah, we talked about the, the purpose of transition planning uh, is to connect youth to employment or continued education after high school. Um, we find that in the first few years after high school, up into the early 20s, about four out of 10 youth are completely disconnected from both work and continued education opportunities. This comes from the National Longitudinal Transition Study Two, a $21 million taxpayer funded study conducted by the Department of Education. Um, so that means that four out of 10 youth on the autism spectrum have never had a single job, have never had any kind of post-secondary education opportunity up through their um, early 20s. If we zoom in on this four out of 10 people and we ask, well, well, what are they doing, right? We would hope that people who are disconnected from opportunity after high school, well, maybe they're getting help of some sort. Maybe they're enrolled in some kind of services or job training or something like that that's a stepping stone service to help move them along towards um, uh, outcomes. So what we found is that one out of four of these disconnected youth also had no access and no participation whatsoever in any kind of services uh, since leaving high school. So they're doubly disconnected. They're disconnected from opportunity and they're disconnected from stepping stones that might uh, lead them to opportunities. So, so this is uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek, it's a blank page. This is really uh, kind of making a plea for um, the need for better data. Oh, I've got one minute left. <laughs> um, I, I believe, I'm a believer in measuring results. Um, so I come from a background before higher education, working in the nonprofit sector, doing program evaluation. I have a lot of friends in business and industry. And in business and industry, there's a bottom line. You know if you're, you're making money, you know if you're moving product and services. We fundamentally lack that. We, we, we have these laudable efforts to develop model practices and define best practice guidelines, um, but our ability to actually track the results of those efforts is very limited. And so I'm really um, a, a very powerful advocate at the government and the nonprofit agency level for developing more real-time, more effective indicators of how we're doing in terms of the performance of our programs and services so that we can know and make course corrections um, whether we're moving towards the goals that we aspire. And for us at the Life Course Outcomes Program, that means uh, really moving in a direction of a guiding vision that we have that we believe that people on the autism spectrum are valuable members of our communities. They have roles to play, dreams to pursue, and, and they, have, they have things to contribute. And, and it's really an opportunity creation mindset that we're trying to foster where the big challenge is creating opportunities for people to participate and contribute in society and unlock their potential. So thank you very much for your invitation here and I'm very grateful for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. <laughs> Paul, you have to share with me that uh, app for the self-timer. I, I, um, I think it would be a valuable thing for me to use. 